Good day, everyone, and um, welcome to another Sunday. This is Harvest Bible Chapel, Tux and Caicos. Um, thank you very much uh, to the worship team, as usual, for a nice, passionate worship. We always appreciate what you do on an ongoing basis, and we pray that God will continue to enrich and to strengthen you as you serve in his vineyard. So last week, we dealt with uh, part of our blueprint series, um, focusing on Matthew chapter 7 from verses 15 to 20, and we saw that we need to be aware that we do not be deceived by false teachers and false prophets. And that was a very serious warning to us as believers. And following that series, there a lot of comments and uh, people ask a lot of questions. And one in particular that I will kind of address before I go into this week's teaching, which is a follow-on on the last week's teaching, uh, was the question that do false teachers and false prophets really know that they are false? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer, but I'm going to address it before I start. Um, now, there are those who are agents of the devil, whether we want to accept it or not. They are agents of the devil, and so they are purely obeying the voice of their master, and they are doing what their master wants, even though they are still disguised as sheep, even though they are wolves. Now, this was rampant even in the time of the early church because Paul addressed a number of these in some of his letters. In particular, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12 to 15, this is what he wrote to the church in Corinth. He said, and what I am doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same time as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So there are some in this category. They are purely servants of the devil. And if the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light, it's a PC, they can do the same too. Now, there are those who are genuinely, they started off right. They were born again, saved, sanctified, and everything. But they, they got deceived along the way by the deceitfulness of riches. And they took their eyes off the ball. They follow the path of covetousness. They followed their belly. The Bible says that their belly is their God. And so they, 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 the mammon became their God. But they continue to deceive. They continue to portray themselves as true teachers and prophets, but in actual fact, they are false. So you have those two categories of, of those. Some are aware that they are false. Some are under another spirit, which is satanic spirit. So they may not be aware that they are false. They're just following orders, and they're just doing what their master beat them to do. So I'm going to leave it there. But there's a lot to talk about that topic which will not be for this forum, but we believe that God in another setting will allow us to be able to deal with that. So today we are focusing on Matthew chapter 7 from verses 21 to 23. And if you're making notes, the topic for this teaching is avoid heaven's surprises. Avoid heaven's surprises. Now in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, the Bible says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, 
Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness or you workers of unrighteousness. So try to imagine someone shows up at your front door asking to come in. They know your name. They know your likes and your dislikes. The cute things your kids have done recently, they know about it. Where you went for vacation last year, and even many more information about you. But you don't even recognize them. The question is, will you let them in? <laughs> will you say, oh, come on in. <laughs> yeah, you know so much about me. Come in. Open the door for them. Take them to the living room. Uh, you wouldn't do that. See, with Facebook and other social media, people can know a lot about us without any real relationship with us. And so, in a similar way, our knowing things about Jesus forms no basis for entry into heaven. It hinges on the knowledge, on his knowledge of us. It hinges on a relationship that we have with him. See, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 is a passage that are used by Christians sometimes to refer to those they believe never were saved to begin with. That's, that's the way some, some believers use it. But according to the passage, there are those who call Jesus Lord, Lord, as we see in verse 21. There were those who prophesied, as we saw in verse 22. There were those who cast out demons, as we saw in verse 22, and some who even did many mighty works, but they are not known by the Lord. See, the words of Matthew 7, 21 to 23, as spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ, seem difficult to believe. <laughs> really seems difficult to believe. How could those the Lord knew prophesy cast out demons, and do many wonders in his name. They said they did it in his name. See, according to Jesus in, the, in these verses, these individuals believed they were saved. They actually called Jesus Lord. But they didn't live out their faith. See, Jesus will more or less agree with Apostle James when the half-brother of Jesus says that faith without works is dead. You see, in Philippians 1, 15 to 18, Paul was writing to the church in Philippi, describing some people who are ministering to other people. He says some of them are preaching Christ out of envy and strife. And some are doing it out of goodwill. <laughs> See, those who are doing it out of envy and strife were doing it to add more to his pain and to his hardship. And those are doing it out of goodwill to support the work of God. But I say, you know what? Whether out of envy and strife or out of goodwill, Christ is still being preached. <laughs> That's the irony of the whole thing. Christ is still being preached. Even though they are doing it, with a different agenda, with a different mission, with a different purpose, but Christ is still being preached. The work is still being done in Jesus' name. But as for those who claim to be doing it, that's a completely different story. And that is why the whole Sermon on the Mount from Matthew 5, 6, and 7, as we have said all along, hinges on issues of the heart. There are those who... As I said earlier on, they were agents of the devil and they do things according to their master. There are those who are doing it for ulterior motive. In what we call duplicity, we give reasons, some reasons for what we do, but actually the, re the real reasons why we do it is at variance with the reasons that we gave for doing it. <laughs> 
And that, that, that's the hard part of it. So as we read through this New Testament uh, scripture, beginning with Gospel of Matthew, we, we come across this chilling statement in Matthew 7, 21 that says, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It is a simple but saddening fact. Not everyone who calls Jesus Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And here Jesus is referring to people who currently call him Lord. So when Jesus spoke this word, people could see him and they could directly address him as Lord. In our case, we don't physically see Jesus, yet we address him as such even in our prayers. As we talk to him, we call him Lord, Master. See, there will be praying people who are denied entrance into the kingdom of God. So, how many will go to Jesus claiming much less and be turned away? See, like people who will go and say, Lord, didn't I go to church every Sunday? Didn't I teach Sunday school or teach the believers class? Didn't I have regular quiet times? <laughs> Unfortunately, no amount of religious activity will gain us entrance into the kingdom of heaven. See, the kingdom of heaven is not for those who merely identify and address Jesus as Lord with their words, but who acknowledge him as Lord with their lives. And that's the key thing. See, you can intellectually profess Christ, but it hasn't migrated from your intellect to your heart. See, this contrast is made clearer when Jesus said in Luke 6 and 46, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you? <laughs> because that's, that's, that's the real thing. Why, why are you proclaiming me as Lord and you are not doing what I ask you to do? Simple instruction, don't lie, don't, don't gossip, don't do this, don't do that. So I'm really not your Lord. So it's frightening to think about going to hell. Even though some people say there's no hell, well, good for them. <laughs> it's even more frightening to find out too late that you are going to hell when you thought you were going to heaven. And still more frightening to think that not just a few, but many, that's what the scriptures say, many will have this experience of being turned away. You see, some people think that they are Christians simply because they come to church every Sunday. Simply because they call Jesus Lord. Simply because they even do mighty works in his name. And yet... They either are not truly saved or they never were saved. <laughs> you see, because in verse 22, it says that on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name? And these are the things that tickle us as believers. People run from one meeting to the other, looking for these mighty works. They look for prophecies. They want to see people casting out demons. And see so many mighty works. See, Jesus goes on to say that many who have seemingly done supernatural ministry in his name will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And I, I pray a lot for people who are engaged in those kind of ministry that, that they are doing it for God and with God's permission. And they are genuine in their own relationship with God. See, because sometimes we wonder... That if we have really done things, or if they only claim to have done them. Because people do things that we're not sure. They tell us certain things that they have done in Jesus' name. And sometimes it is not true. There was one um, clip that I saw years ago of this person who was supposedly helping um, some orphanages and some things in the name of God. And when CBS investigation went around, they found out that it was just a lie. Um, <laughs> Jesus doesn't seem to care either way. Because prophesying, casting out demons, and other mighty works are no basis for entering the kingdom of God. There will be many denied entrants who claim to have done such things. 
there will be surprises in heaven. People that we actually, we already say, guaranteed they will be in the front seat. We'll be surprised. <laughs> they'll, they'll be turned away. That's the sad reality. See, when we read this passage, it can be tempting to throw up our hands and say, who then can know if they'll be saved? It sure seems like a huge gamble. You do your best to follow Jesus, but who knows whether you get smacked down at the end. Those are the kind of things that might be going on in our hearts at the, at the moment listening to this. But that's not Jesus' goal here. That's not what it was all about. First, he warned us about false prophets and false teachers. He doesn't want us to be deceived by false teaching so that we don't miss heaven. But neither does he want us to live in the terror or uncertainty about our final state. We can be sure about that part. So let me offer two ways to maintain and even build assurance in the face of this frightening passage. Number one, you need to recognize, if you're making notes, you need to recognize what it means to do the Father's will. See, in verse 21, Jesus describes the one who will enter the kingdom as the one who does the will of my Father. That's what he says. But what exactly does that mean? What does it mean to do the Father's will? See, judging by the context, because it's the context that helps us to understand. And actually, it is the text that makes the context what it is. If you take away the text, then it becomes a, a con job. All right? So, in the context, it means more than simply saying, Lord, Lord. It means more than doing mighty works in Jesus' name. So, how can we know if we're doing the Father's will? And do we have to do it perfectly? To see the answer, we should know that this is the only second time in the whole of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has spoken of entering the kingdom of heaven. And each time we taught on this series so far, almost every person who has taught on this series made reference to Matthew 5, 20. Because that is the only other time that that word was used of entering into the kingdom of heaven. It says that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when we compare these two passages, we can say that doing the Father's will is parallel to possessing a greater righteousness. So by implication, Matthew 7, 21 to 23 is describing those whose righteousness did not exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And there are numerous passages from chapter 5, chapter 6, and even going into 7, describing to us how the Pharisees operate. They have gone to establish their own righteousness. Christ's righteousness is not good enough for them. So here is why this matters. See, when Jesus says that our righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees, he's not saying, do what they did, but do it better. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. It's not that the Pharisees didn't try hard enough. It's that they were trying really hard at the wrong things. And so that's why we need to constantly challenge what we are doing and ask ourselves, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I want to be in the worship team? Why do I want to serve as in the welcome team? You see, they were missing the point entirely. They were focusing on external behaviors to get people's praise while neglecting to do justice, love, kindness, and to walk humbly with God. See, that's what we see in Micah chapter 6 from verse 6. And this is what God said to the people of, of God. He said, with what shall I come before the Lord 
and bow before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Those are very heavy duty stuff. But in verse 8, he said, look, forget about all those things. I mean, if you want to do it, it's okay, but that's not what's going to get God's attention. He said, he has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to work humbly with your God? But the Pharisees were doing all this other stuff, but they were neglecting all these things. And so in Matthew 23 and 23, this is how he described them. He said, what to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, which is justice and mercy and faithfulness. See, this you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So he's not saying that they should not tithe. He said, no, don't neglect tithing. It's good for you to do it. But these other stuff are even more important that you have neglected. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You ought to have done them without neglecting the other ones that you are already doing. See, the scribes and Pharisees didn't do the Father's will, period. So if you want to see how they treated God's command, you need to read what we have taught on in Matthew 5, 21 to 48. It's a, it's a detailed description of them. If you want to see how they fasted and prayed, how they gave alms, you read Matthew 6 from verse 1 to 18. We already taught on that. See, their righteousness wasn't a sincere attempt to please God, which, is a, which a fastidious Jesus then looked at and said, pretty good for all that you're doing, but not quite good enough to enter the kingdom. <laughs> it was a self-promoting pile of filthy rags, as we saw in Isaiah 64 verse 6. All those things are filthy rags. See, doing the Father's will isn't just an external thing. See, the Pharisees look clean on the outside, but they were filthy and lawless within. See, what Jesus describes here is a righteousness that flows from a pure heart and a sincere faith. It's fruit, the fruit that's good because it grew out of a good tree. As we saw, you know, in the previous passage, a, a good tree will bear good fruit. It's the kind of righteousness that you can only practice when you've been born again through the Spirit of God and have thus, in one sense, entered the kingdom already. Jesus isn't telling us to out-Pharisee the Pharisees. <laughs> Nor is he saying we must keep the Sermon on the Mount perfectly in order to be sure we are true Christians. But what he's saying to us is that true Christian is someone who continually prays, Father, forgive me my debts, as we saw in the, you know, in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive me my debt. See, because we need to constantly search our heart. Ask God to search us, search our heart daily. It's the Pharisees who thanks God that he's better than others. Because we saw in that uh, passage in Luke 18, 9 to 14, that cry grave is a parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector that went into the temple to, to pray. And the Pharisee was talking about how he fasted twice a week, how he gave a tenth of everything he has, how he gave alms to the poor and how nice he is. But the, the other fellow was just down there with his head bowed down and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He said, who do you think out of the two of them went home refreshed, satisfied? See, the narrow path, as we said before, is for people who are poor in spirit who mourn over their sin, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those people will be satisfied, but now 
and especially later, when Jesus consummates his kingdom. See, doing the Father's will isn't some impossible standard. Actually, doing the Father's will can describe you, and you can know it describes you. And if you are a true Christian, it will describe you, though you are imperfect, but you're getting there. It's a work in progress. See, the, the, for the true Christian, the question is not, am I perfect? See, Christ has already imputed righteousness on us. So that's not going to change. We don't need to do anything about that. But the question is, do I know Jesus? Or better still, does Jesus know me? <laughs> because he didn't question those people by saying, you don't know me, but I don't know you. <laughs> and so that leads to my second point. Number two, you need to recognize the primary knower here. K-N-O-W-E-R. Who is the knower? Who is the person? See, throughout most of my life, when I read verse 23, it is as though Jesus was saying, depart from me because you never knew me. <laughs> but that's not what he's saying. It's, it's like, you were never truly saved. But that's true, but what he's actually saying is, I never knew you. You know me, you think you were saved, but I don't know you. You see, it's not ultimately a question of whether we know him, as important as that is, but whether he knows us. See, I'm reminded of a great scene in the, in the book, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. There's a discussion there between Edmund and Eustace. See, here in Edmund speak of his experiences with Aslan, the unknowing Eustace inquires. But who is Aslan? <laughs> Do you know him? Then Edmund responds, well, he knows me. <laughs> He's the great lion, the son of the emperor beyond the sea, who saved me and saved Narnia too. But did Edmund know Aslan? Of course. But when asked whether he did, Edmund was thinking less about his own erudition and more about As how Aslan had loved him and given himself for him on the stone table while he was still a traitor. He knew Aslan, yes, but only because Aslan first knew him. And it's the same thing for us. See, God knew us too. He knew us first. In 1 Corinthians 8 and 3, the Bible says that, but now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God. That's important. There's nothing wrong with us knowing God, but we need to be known by God. He's now asking them, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? In Galatians 4.9. And 1 Corinthians 8 and 3 say, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So you need to love God, and you need to be known by God. And the question to us this morning is, does God know you? Does God know you? Are you the kind of person Jesus is going to meet as an old friend on the last day? I ask because there are actually going to be people like that. People whom Jesus is going to look at and say, Hello, John. It's good to finally meet you face to face. I've always enjoyed our conversation in prayers. And I've never stopped interceding for you. I know you went through a lot for my sake. You were not ashamed of me. And I want you to know I'm not ashamed of you either. Welcome home, brother. I look forward to continuing our friendship throughout eternity. Is that what you're going to get? See, we don't have to live in terror of the final day. And that's, that's, that's my message. 
We can be preparing for it. We just need to challenge our heart. We need to allow God to x-ray our heart. Show us the dark patches. Show us the ulterior motive. Show us the, the self-promoting motive. Show us pride and things that's not supposed to be there. Help us to love kindness, justice, and, and to, to, to have humility in our life. Because for those, whom, for, for those known by Jesus, the final day won't be some huge disruption. It's going to be a joy. It will just be a simple, uh, a heightened continuation of the relationship we already enjoy with him right now by faith. It's just a continuation. To be out of the body is to be with the Lord. That, that's what he says. It's a continuation. It's just a step from one to the other. So let's examine ourselves as we close. And not only ask, do I know Jesus? Well, let's ask, does Jesus know me? And if we can't answer that second question, let's, let's talk to God. Let's live in such a way that he will not be ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters on that day. And let's not be deceived because this is too good to miss. This is too good to miss. Heaven and hell is for eternity. But the choice we are making here and now is heaven. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise for your word. As scary and as frightening as it is, Thank you because as your children, we can know now that we love you, that we know you, and that you know us. Help us to get rid of all the distractions, all the things that doesn't count, all the things that people think will put them in the front position. But show us and help us to pursue the things that really matters to God. To do the Father's will from our heart. To translate our intellectual knowledge to our heart. And to live every day with a pure heart. Do this for us. Do this for your children, God. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen and amen.